you, we're based on resilience engineering. Um, we're interested in um, safety, we're interested in the way that people work, um, the everyday work. Um, and in Tikanga Māori, we're going to talk a bit about that, but it's the coming together of these two houses of knowledge is what we find um, really interesting and, and leads to the sort of the innovative approaches that we're hoping to see um, in Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, so tonight, I'm just going to check this stiff here, Joe. Uh, yes, there she is. Got a Steph. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, our two colleagues. So this is um, Steph Turner, uh, who is the director of Aikonaku at the um, Health Quality and Safety Commission for um, New Zealand. And um, she's just connecting, I can see her. Uh, and Steph and I have been involved for the last couple of years of really discussing about what does it look like when we consider these two worlds and bring them together as an overarching approach to safety? What is it that Matarangi Māori, the Māori knowledge systems bring, and how does that fit with resilient healthcare? Kia ora, Steph. Thanks for joining us. Um, so I'll hand over to Joe now to introduce uh, Graham, if that's right. But kia ora, Steph. Welcome. Um, kia ora, Koto. Greetings, everybody. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, the owner and Caroline here also from the Health Quality Safety Commission. It's nice to see you here. So I'm going to introduce my um, my colleague, Graham. So Graham and I have been working for a few years now looking at um, how we might work um, with restorative practice and hohotonga pai, which is peacemaking, the Māori worldview. Um, and I first met Graham when I visited to Moana Atoi, which is where he's from. Um, and he is um, endorsed by the iwi there as a practitioner of Pohotoronga Pai, but he's much more than that. Um, he, he's also the Deputy Director and Equity Lead at the Interim Public Health Agency. Um, and um, he is my partner in Restorative Mahi and, and the co-chair of the National Collaborative for Restorative Initiatives and Health. And he can also cook a roast dinner whilst providing seriously good advice on very complex issues. So I'm very grateful to have Graham here with us today. Um, and I will hand over now, I believe, to Graham and Steph. <coughs> um, well, I'm Hiko Ana Kia Okoto. Uh, Ete tuatahi kia kōrua, Joe, uh, kōrua ko kāo i aua kapu uh, whakanui ngā mihi kia kōrua katai kia kōto. Uh, mai ngā haue whā, uh, nei mahara mai ki tēnei pito pito kōrero. Um, just to say good evening, I'm going to um, have my camera off during the slides because one, you should be looking at the slides and two, that'll help the Wi-Fi be more stable. Um, Carl, could you pop back to the one before that, the black one, which will be a bit disturbing for people, I imagine, but um, uh, so uh, what we wanted to do was to talk to you about um, harm in a Māori world and to do that is to use a narrative, is to use a story. So I'm just going to start with a short story and then Steph and I just kind of reflect <clears throat> on some of the, um, uh, the key concepts that come out of that story. So this is understanding how we as tangata whenua, people of the land, the indigenous people of Aotearoa New Zealand understand harm. Um, Carl, could you go back one slide? Nope, one in between. That's all I got uh, there. That's all right, we'll start with that then. Uh, nā reira. Uh, te tīmatanga ko te kore. Uh, so before anything was formed in a Māori worldview, uh, there was nothingness. Uh, and the nothingness was uh, complete uh, and absolute. Uh, and all-encompassing. Um, but in the nothingness was the potential for everything uh, and the potential for all. Uh, no te kore kapote mai ko te pō. And from that potential, from that first word, uh, ko te kupu, uh, kapote mai ko te pō, came the night. And in the, in the Māori world, the night is the creation of everything but the awareness of nothing and 
terms of relationships. So whilst everything was there, there was no relationship between anything. <clears throat> and it was into this space that there came to be two beings, Rangi Nui and Papa Tuanuku. And Papa Tuanuku was below and Rangi Nui was above. Uh, and between them, uh, in that embrace of love, they birthed many, many children. And different tribes around New Zealand have a different number of those children, but there are some significant children who are known by all tribes in New Zealand. Uh, for example, Tane Mahuta, uh, who is personified as the forest and the bush. Uh, Tangaroa, who is personified as the waters of the sea. Uh, Rongomatane, uh, who is the personification of peace uh, and seen as the rainbow. Haumaitikitiki, who is the personification of wild foods. Uh, Tumatawinga, the personification of war. Uh, and Tafirimatia, the personification of the winds. And there are many, many other children. They were all birthed between their parents there in Tepo in the night. And so they lived a stunted existence between their two parents. Uh, they were crouched and huddled, unable to move around, unable to see, uh, and not in any relationship with each other. You know, at times their parents moved, and it was when their parents moved that a flash of light came into that space. And Tane Mahuta, who was one of the older children, uh, had an idea. Uh, and it was his idea that there was something beyond their poor and beyond the embrace of their parents. And so from that idea came the first, what we call wānanga. And wānanga are um, meetings of learning, uh, circles of learning. Uh, and so the first wānanga occurred there between the parents of all of those brothers and sisters. And Tāne Mahu to put to them uh, that they should seek for a way to let the light flood in between their parents. And so they debated this, and Tu Matawinga, who, as I said, is the personification of war, he suggested that they should kill their parents. Um, Tafiri Matia, who is the personification of wind, uh, he was against any movement of the parents and thought it would be destructive and a terrible thing to do. Rungo Matane, the personification of peace, was upset by the debate and didn't enter into the wānanga. But Tane Mahuta said, rather than killing or damaging their parents, what if they separated the parents? You know, so they debated over the eons, and that's what they agreed in time to do. Tafari Matia didn't agree, and some of the other brothers and sisters didn't agree, but the majority agreed to enter into that. And so with that consensus, they all attempted to move their parents. And after many attempts and many failures, Tane Mahuta had a bright idea. So instead of pushing with his shoulders against his father and his feet against his mother, he lay down on his mother and put his feet against his father and he pushed his legs apart and slowly, 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 his parents were separated. And then we have the third stage, which is from Te Pō, from the night, Kaputemai o Te Ao Marama, which is the next slide, Carl. Uh, and Te Ao Marama is the world of light and understanding. Could you move on, Carl? Next slide. Thank you. Lovely. Um, and, and so what happened was sun flooded in and space flooded in and the parents were permanently separated. Uh, and But when the brothers and sisters did that, the first harm entered the world, which is they saw the damage they'd done to their parents because they'd been together so long that they'd grown together and so they'd been torn apart and there was... Uh, blood and other fluids and there was the father's tears and all of the children who had been part of the separation were distressed by what they did <clears throat> and so what they set about doing was trying to repair the damage that occurred and they did that by creating a beautiful cloak for their mother so Tane Mahuta created the forests and the bush Tangaroa created the seas for example uh, and then Tāne Mahuta, supported by his brothers and sisters, created a cloak of blue for his father, and in the night, a cloak of black. And across that blackness, he cast the stars, uh, and in time, the moon and the sun. However, this resolution of harm didn't involve 
their mother and father and didn't involve their brothers and sisters who agreed, who disagreed with their actions. And so what led, what this led to was war between the brothers and sisters. Tafari Matia, who was really angered by the separation of his parents, set to war against his brothers and sisters and tore up all that they had created. And over eons, they fought back and forth until only in time, Tafari Matia was overcome by his brother Tumatoinga, the personification of war. And so that damage remained between those brothers and sisters. And so Tani Mahuta thought long and hard about that damage. And in time, decided to return to his mother to seek a work that would honour her. And it's that work that led him to the creation of the first human being. So first of all, he set, he set off for a place that his mother had suggested he go to Kurawaka to find a particular soil. And when he was there, he created a soil sculpture of a woman. Uh, and um, he pressed his nose to the nose of that soil sculpture. And it's there that he said the first karakia, which, is, which ended with ki te whaiao, ki te ao marama, te hei mauri ora. Come into the world of light and understanding. I breathe my breath into you, uh, and what comes forth is life. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, Carl. And so was created the first human being. And the first human being was a woman, uh, which is um, uh, Hine Ahuone, the woman created of soil. And her and Tane had children together, and the first of those was a daughter, which is who you see here, Hine Titama. But Hine Titama uh, said, Matawai ananga fatui te tiruhanga. She was so beautiful that just to look on her face would bring you to tears. And so her father lusted after her. And so being a god, he transformed his appearance and he became her husband as well. And in this particular story, all of the whakapapa, all of the genealogy of Māori comes from the union of Hinetitama and Tāne Mahuta. But what Hinetitama didn't know, of course, was that her lover was also her father. But in time, she began to ask questions. And so she asked her mother, Hine Ahuone, who is my father? Because she'd never met her father. Uh, and her answer was, go and ask your lover. So she went to Tāne Mahuta and she asked, who is my father? And Tāne Mahuta said, go and ask the posts of your house. So in our cultural practice, if you come into our meeting houses, all of our genealogy is carved onto the posts. And in the East Coast, anyway, if the house has no carven posts, what it means is that there was no genealogy before those people. So when Hine Titama went back to her house, she found there was no carvings on the posts of her house. And so she knew that her father was also her lover. Her lover. And so there's the second great wrong that entered into our world, the great, the, the great harm that occurred. Uh, and Hine Titama was enormously distressed uh, with the, the wrong of what had occurred. Uh, and so as a result, chose to reject the greatest gift of Tāne Mahuta to us as Māori, which is the Aumarama, which is the world of light and understanding. The Tāne Mahuta and her had the first Hohoi Tarongupai, the first restorative meeting because Tani said to not leave him permanently and so what Hine and him negotiated was that she would become Hine Nui Tepo, the guardian of the night uh, and he would remain the guardian of the world of light and understanding and that we as people would live in the light for a time but we would return to our mother through death at the end back to Hine Nui Tepo. and so for us that is the first great harm but also the first great restorative practice. So um, thank you for bearing me with me there. We can move on to the next slide, Carl. So this is what I'd like to bring Stefan. I think there's kind of three concepts we'd like to talk to you about that are in this story. The first one is our understanding as tangata whenua uh, about what life is about, um, what well-being means to us. The second one is what harm means in that space. And the third one is how relationship relates to that. Steph, are you there? Would you like to make some comments after that? Oh, kia ora, Graham. Um, tuatahi kanui te mihi. Uh, kia koutou, 
e hui mai nei te nei po. Just a big mihi to you all um, from all, all your, your places. Um, yes, I, I, I suppose, what, what, what can I add? Graham's provided a, 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 a whakapapa, a, um, our Māori world view, a genealogical um, whakapapa, which for us, um, as Tangata Whenua and, and Aotearoa is um, our theory of everything. And I suppose you might say, oh, whether, we, whether I talk about this now, Graham, <laughs> about um, our, our current and contemporary context, you know, around working in health and um, health, health care and doing no harm but a, a, and restorative approach, but also resilient um, health care. Uh, I suppose I, you know, that's the starting point is to acknowledge the whakapapa, the, um, the, 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 what has come before. There's, there's always a context of what has come before and what's informed us in whatever context we're in. So um, the Māori worldview is really that whakapapa is our theory of everything. You only know your place and where you are in the world or in a, in a structure or an organization or a system if you understand that whakapapa, what's formed it, what's been the system of um, the created, how, how has it been created, what have been the ideologies, um, the philosophies that have informed um, the system that you're in, what's the whakapapa, what's come before. So um, that's the starting point, <laughs> Graham. Uh, Kapai, so, Steph. yeah, yeah. Yeah, Kapai. Yeah, I want to pick up on a few things just briefly and then um, open it up to everyone. Which, so, what Steph has opened up are the, these three slides, three points. The first one is. Uh, for Māori, well-being is holistic uh, and is related to this concept of tapu. And I think most Indigenous people have a similar concept, which is this idea of well-being and dignity being something you inherit from your ancestors uh, and that it is your responsibility in life to enhance. So our well-being isn't tied to our body or to our physical experience, but it's tied to our intergenerational relationships to our tapu and our responsibility is to hand that down to our children or our nephews or our nieces. Next slide, um, Carl. The problem is, of course, in life, harm happens, uh, but in a worldview that's about tapu, that is about dignity and well-being and the responsibility for the generations others, uh, generations that are coming and those that have passed, then Understanding the process of harm isn't about incidents, uh, isn't about anomalies. It's about harm as an everyday uh, experience in life, uh, as well as an incident experience, as well as you know an exceptional experience. And it's a recognition that there are always things that are reducing. Uh, diminishing your sense of well-being and dignity and that of your community and that threaten your ability to look after those who come after you and so that impact leads to is we, is that process of whakanoa the process of diminishment uh, needs to be managed on a daily basis within Indigenous communities rather than uh, as an exceptional experience that's just managed every now and then. Next slide, Carl. And so this is where relationship, which we talk about as whakapapa, is key. So whakapapa, I suppose in translation, means to create a foundation, uh, but it is that which links us from the very beginning uh, to well beyond our own lives. And as you can see there, everything is linked by whakapapa. And in a Māori worldview, we're the youngest of all created beings. So we are uh, intimately and relationally linked with our environment, uh, with all that has been created before us. And it also links our knowledge forms and our stories 
And so therefore it also links our experience of harm. So harm is a part of our story. It's not an incident. It's not an anomaly. It's something that needs to be integrated into one's life story. And so recognizing probably gone well over our time for this first part, I guess I wanted to end by saying that harm, the way we manage it in a healthcare setting, treats harm as an anomaly or something that needs to be uh, overcome and put behind us, uh, that needs to be filed away once the policy has been followed. But in a Māori worldview, harm becomes part of our experience of our story. And so it's more like how you treat trauma, which is if you want to overcome trauma, you have to integrate it into one's life experience. And so the clash between the normal healthcare process for dealing with harm uh, and what might be seen as a more resilient way of dealing with harm is the clash between treating things as incidents or exceptional as opposed to part of our relationship to the experience to the people who are part of that experience and to those affected by it far outside those relationships. So Carl, recognizing we've taken up heaps of time at the start, maybe we'll pause there, then we can have a conversation. Thank you very much, Graham, for that. And I guess is that, um, part of this conversation, I guess is that the, these ideas are, are really about as we've talked about this fucking pop, this connection we have to the past and the future, that these future conditions are what shape us and also are what condition the future of other people and this relational way of working. And we the ideas have really been we've been exploring these at the, the commission. And we have a, an overarching program now and we think about how do these ideas work. Um, and think about this program we have called Heitoki Nao Matariki Aotearoa, which is really the idea that we we are the builders of this new system, a new way of thinking about things. Um, and some of these ideas really, when we talk about them, you'll see in the talks that, that have been so eloquently expressed about this idea about the people, that the relationships we have is the purpose of the system. And it's this idea of understanding context and connection and, and understanding the outcomes um, and about how we really work together to create safety and how do we understand the different worlds in which we uh, exist. Um, so I'm going to stop just there, but just to say that this is something that these ideas are, are really part of um, informing the way that we think about our systems and informing that, that history that, that we bring to them. Um, so I guess I'd just be interested if there's people's comments or reflections on the first part before we go to the next part of looking at some other examples or of Joe's work. I don't know where to start. It's really awesome. I wish we were able to do something similar in Australia with uh, with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, which we we have not done very well at all. So it's it's really interesting to see. Um, yeah. One of the yeah, things. Done... Oh, go, go. That's right. I was just going to say. I, I think. Um... Uh, having uh, some friends in Melbourne, they're working really closely with um, the First Nations peoples in uh, Melbourne, and um, there's clearly deep connection in terms of this idea that there isn't, it isn't case harm is not binary, not harm um, and harm, but harm is again part of the experience of life and the integration into story. So I found that fascinating. Also kind of, again, how it's immersed in the land. So that's where it's really different from our experience is that their processes for managing harm are about the land that they're on. And, and probably it's the first thing because it's, it's got to be immersed in your experience of your land for it to have integrity, to have integrity. Thanks, Ellen. Sorry, Ellen or Mary? I'm not sure which one. No, I, was just, I was just pointing out that Ellen's hands was up, hand was up. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
thank you for a very interesting uh, introduction. Um, I'm thinking that you're talking about uh, you're you're talking you're sort of re revealing the history of of your culture, and I'm just wondering what arenas um, are used to to do these uh, negotiations and develop and to develop the this understanding of, of the story uh, that would be interesting to know because when we are talking about developing culture in healthcare we are uh, concerned with uh, developing arenas for that and um, uh, and it would be interesting to know why what kind of uh, how we could learn from your arenas that's a really good question Ellen. Um, I'm keeping my camera off, not because I have food on my face, but because it works better that way. Um, uh, so um, in each of our what we call district health boards, which are our hospital areas here in New Zealand, um, there are um, different ways of rela having relationships with the tribes in those areas. Uh, and those normally councils or committees bring the tribes together and those are the places where these conversations happen. The conversation about what is harm, how do we deal with harm, what are traditional or indigenous ways of dealing with harm. Um, but I think Joe and I would both own and Steph would probably be the same. These are still fledgling discussions in terms of in the healthcare setting, but they're old traditions in our indigenous communities. And so in our indigenous communities, these are held by those home communities uh, and that is their authority and their conversation. Uh, hopefully that helped. One of the things that's been quite, oh, sorry, Steph, yeah. Yeah, no, kia ora, Carl. Just to add um, to Graham's point, um, absolutely, that's first and foremost that the um, any health um, structure, uh, leadership structure has mana whenua, has relationship, not in partnership actually, if we, we're looking at te tiriti or waitangi, um, that, that, that's what every um, health organisation in Aotearoa is obligated to ensure there's a partnering approach. So we're lucky in the fact that we have a treaty um, and we rely on it. And saying that, um, you know, that there's, uh, there's, with the articles um, of the treaty, there's um, you know there's one that's focused on equity. Every New Zealand citizen having the right to equitable outcomes. Um, there's also uh, Article Two talks about Maori um, having the maintaining and um, their tino ranga tiratanga. That means that um, their knowledge and resources, and that there's actually. Um, we have a responsibility if we work in a crown structure to um, ensure that that is occurring. So Māori led, Māori knowledge um, used and informed, uh, Māori uh, uh, everything commissioned, you know. Um, so there's, you know, it's easy to say that um, and we've been talking about it a long time. So some of the things we've had to do uh, we've been very clear around education. Now, you know, a lot of Māori are pretty sort of um, at that point where we've um, we've spent a lot of time and energy um, educating uh, recognition of that there is such a thing as Māori worldview and historical knowledge and systems and ways of seeing and doing things in the world. And even actually that... that we, we are, have a responsibility and accountability for ensuring those things happen in everyday health system norms and practice. So, um, but we've, we've, you know, not done very well in all sorts of fronts. And we're talking about that in real ways. And we have to get beyond the, we have to employ more Indigenous people for a start. So that, you know, <laughs> that, that, that's, a, that's a key thing um, to have... Um, those mātauranga, Māori norms, as norms, as daily norms and system development and system design and in practice delivery. So that's, that's um, you know, 
part of what we're doing, really. There's all sorts of um, mechanisms and initiatives that, you know, we, we've got underway to drive this, yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Just saying as a partner in this work, it's been really interesting seeing that the, there's so much more coherence between um, the Māori worldview and versus the industrial processes that we're all kind of been fighting against. You know, this idea that one size fits all and we just do more and more of the system and crank through this much more differentiated view and a more relational way of working. We're seeing it being much more coherent with um, Te Ao Māori and resilient healthcare kind of principles. Um, Jeanette, That's... I'm just going to go to you. Yeah. Sorry. Jeanette, hello, lovely to see you. Yeah, hi. <laughs> no, I, I, lovely story. I enjoyed it really. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from history. So uh, I just have uh, uh, two questions to understand the concept or, or the way they, they look at the world and at the harm. Harm, if that's a part of life, is, uh, can you, is it constant or can you increase and diminish harm? That's one question. Uh, from their point of view, your ancestors, and can man affect uh, harm by creating harmful situations? Great questions, Jeanette. Thank you. Um, answer to your first question, uh, the simple answer would be yes, uh, which is so in a Māori worldview, we are in constant relationship with each other, with the environment, with uh, the spiritual. Uh, and um, so we have what we call tikanga, which is correct or right processes that are designed to protect those ways of relating to each other. And if we follow our tikanga, so the theory goes, uh, then we, we follow, we enhance the well-being of those relationships. And where we uh, go against that tikanga, uh, then we diminish those relationships. Uh, and so then, which also ties to your second question, which is that um, we can diminish the spiritual, we can diminish the environment just as much as they can diminish us in our experience of those. So um, uh, how we treat the, you know, climate change being the obvious one, uh, climate change is, is in a Māori worldview is an obvious example of diminishment of the of the power and authority of our environment by the actions of people and entirely consistent with our understanding of how diminishing relationships occur. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, guys. We might just move on to the second part of the talk now, if that's right, Graham. And, um... Steph, uh, and we'll hand over to Joe and back to Graham again. You're good, Joe. Can you see it? Yep. Can you put it on slideshow, please? I'm trying, but it's. Uh... Oh. Can you see that? Uh, yes, you see but it's not, no, it's, in, it's not in slideshow. You can just, it's probably just if you alt tab and go into the share, share this one. If you go share screen again, and you'll find there's one like this, and there's one with the whole screen. Oh, I've got you. Thank you for the technical help, Doctor. I'm good for something after all. <laughs> Is that better? Better? Yes, it is. Oh, yeah. thank you, Graham. I'm glad somebody's listening to me. And so, I was I apologize. <laughs> so, um, thank Kiora Koto, everybody. Um, so, Graham is very kindly letting me talk um, about our work together, um, which is a, a, an honor and a privilege as a non Indigenous uh, person. So, I'm just going to run you through a bit of a whistle-stop tour of restorative practice um, and hoho tongapai and some of the connections we see here. Um, and you're going to see some beautiful pictures of um, places that connect to 
both myself and Steph and Graham and Carl throughout this talk, um, just to connect all of us um, and to show that kind of connection to of people to place. So this is actually a, a picture of just down the road from my house. Um, and the second slide, just not moving, ah, here we go. So this is a photo just uh, down the road from where Graham comes from. And this whakatoki or this proverb, uh, kia whakatamuri tahara whakamua, um, I walk backwards into the future with my eyes fixed on the past. Um, so that speaks to the Māori kind of perspective of time, where the past and the present and the future are all intertwined. So when we think about systems, that's why we need to think about the whakapapa of a system, because the past is central to and shapes both the present and the future identity of individuals and communities. So from this perspective, the individual carries their past into their future. And the strength of that is that your ancestors are ever present um, and exist both within the spiritual realm, but also in the physical alongside the living as well as within the living. So when we think about the system, the health system within this Māori worldview, we understand that individuals and communities carry their past in, into their present and their future. And by that, I mean that our experiences as individuals and in our relationships with others within a system or an organisation or a team are influenced by our past. Um, and those of our, our ancestors or our whānau or, or the people we're connected to or our colleagues. So how we as individuals or teams or organisations understand or experience safety um, or harm or, or justice, which is another concept which is really important in, in, when we think about safety, they will be incorporated into the whakapapa of this ongoing relationship within others and within context. So that is all encapsulated in that one sentence, and that's what I love about um, Te Reo Matranga. So um, my next slide. Okay, so um, I think that there is a point of in equilibrium and a state of harmony between safety and harm that can be found by looking at health systems through a restorative lens. So in its balanced shape, that's what the koru, this um, picture here represents. And whilst we in the society are focused on what goes well, by leaving out addressing harm, I think we're potentially um, limiting its adoption. Um, and whilst understanding the whakapapa of safety is important, we also need to consider the whakapapa of harm through a restorative lens so that we can build that same understanding about what works and who it works for and in what context it works and how we respond to it. Um, and I think as my colleagues have already mentioned, we can also see that harm is not just about closure or an event, or just about learning for improvement. It's also an experience that's incorporated into the whakapapa of our ongoing relationship with others, um, within our, with ourselves and our context. It's actually really important um, for safety as well because it's this ongoing kind of continuous relationship. So for us in our, in our work, instead of viewing systems as these sort of structures that organize people, institutions and, and resources to deliver safety. We instead see them as communities of tangata uh, people, whanangatanga, which is relationships, and manakitanga, which is, is compassion. So the system resource and source of resilience for us is the people, it's the relationships to each other and what that means um, in terms of the system as a whole. Um, and that is what restorative philosophy is about. So restorative philosophy actually considers the world through a relational lens um, and restorative principles are relational principles that are concerned with upholding human dignity or tapu within human relationships or the nangatanga um, and restorative practices operationalize these relational principles. And they're all concerned with developing knowledge about open, trusting and respectful relationships and how that can create safety, promote well-being, and prevent, mitigate, or respond to harm. Um, but just as we in res resilient healthcare value the study of clinical practice to understand and inform safety, Western restorative philosophy has also been informed by the study of ancient cultures around the world. It's got significant roots in indigenous peacemaking practices in the US and Canada, and here in New Zealand, in Matavanga Māori, which is its indigenous root. 
Um, and the study of pothole tongue pie peacemaking and the tea cane and the practice around that in particular. Um, and the reason that I really want to mention that is because the indigenous root of restorative kind of philosophy is often minimized or misinterpreted in the origin myths of Western systems. And I know that will sound familiar and connect with many of you um, within your own work, but restorative justice in particular um, has been sold uh, in New Zealand as a culturally responsive crown initiative, but it's left the structural kind of power relationships intact that still marginalize the knowledge and the people. Um, and Moana Jackson, who is a Kromatua, well-respected, just recently died, who argued about this ethic of restoration that we have, which is not just about remedying individual instances of power, but requires the constitutional reform that is characterized by self-determination. So just going to be a little mindful of my ethic of restoration as someone who is um, uh, not only um, Pākehā, which means um, everything that's not Māori, but I'm also um, English, um, and I'm mindful of that too. So this is, um, I think you talked about how, how, how might we do this. There's lots of different ways to it, but in, in the work that Graham and I do, we, we're trying to uphold this ethic of restoration within this negotiated space. And this is actually an Indigenous model um, developed by Indigenous academics. And it's a conceptual space of intersection that values and supports Matavanga Māori and, and, and Western science. And it sees them as distinct but complementary bodies of knowledge rather than knowledge that can all be lumped in together. Um, and we use this negotiated space um, and we're testing at the moment, like using restorative practices within that space. Um, it intends to privilege knowledge generated from dialogical processes um, and it intends to unlock like this innovation potential of um, Māori and Western knowledge, people and resources in, in health environments. So in, instead of, um, there's other models as well that are really, really good uh, indigenous models, but I think we can learn something about this approach in our work on safety, um, because we often have a lot of competing philosophies and practices, and it can create quite adversarial conditions. Safety one, safety two is a classic example of that, rather than bringing us together in a space where requisite variety can be can be realized. So akin to the braided rivers, uh, here our uh, birida, um, different worldviews can run beside each other, and with equal strength and they can come together and move away but they spend more time apart than they do together um, so just wanted to talk a little bit about those those models um, of uh, that, that i think can help with our work before moving back to restorative work overall so restorative um health systems uh, recognize that all our relationships as we've talked about have the capacity to enhance our, our safety and our well-being um, or to harm us and they understand that our experience is ever present and can influence system resilience capacity and how people can adapt respond and grow within their relationships with with others and within the system um, and as we said relationships the restorative may maintain in hearts of tapu or our dignity and remembering our whakatoki. Um, at the beginning, when we understand the individuals and teams and communities carry the past and the present and the future, we understand there is always an opportunity for the restoration of dignity or tapu within our relationships with others. And we also understand that there is um, the violations of the diminishment can occur within our relationships with others. So, Graham and I have been thinking about this a lot and we've come up with some principles um, for restorative systems that we think connect with um, some of our thinking around resilience. So the first one is that systems are comprised of people and relationships. So um, restorative systems prioritise, nurture and express these relational values and principles in policy and in practice. Um, and in the Māori worldview, this is understood as whakamangatanga, the building those relationships that enhance tapu and dignity. Um, whaka papa, um, human well-being and relationships are interdependent. So that's appreciating that human relationships are at the core of our experience of the world. They're fundamental to the well-being of, of people and teams and organizations and systems, and they're implicated in how we heal and how we learn. Um, and that approach 
has similarities in the concept of Whakapapa because it touches on that interconnectedness between people and the benefit for future generations. Um, tapu, um, we've talked about that a lot, um, but it is important to say that for Mali, it is the intrinsic worth of all people that is the foundation of their, of their tapu. Um, and the needs of all people affected by the system function are considered equally, regardless of their role or their status. Um, so promote this equity of voice for all the people who provide and receive care. And that's very much the antithesis of how a lot of us experience our work. Um, <clears throat> that we understand that dynamic and uncertain systemic, 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 institutional, relational, and individual context influence safety um, and the ability of people working within the system to respond to and recover from harm. And this is the environment that we all exist in. Uh, and this mahi tahi, that, that relationships enhanced um, by co-production and co-design, um, um, which is a mahi tahi is a process of working together that shares power and risk and opportunity, both when all is well and when things go wrong. So when we think about this within the context of the system, restorative relationships affirm the value and agency of human beings individually and as community people when all is well. And they create this relational slack in the system that can act as a protective factor when things go wrong. The other thing I would say is conflict and disagreement is, is normal. Um, it's not a utopia uh, and it seems to be necessary for the safety of all and safe, respectful dialogue is used to explore different perspectives on an issue, recognizing that people experience and conceptualize safety and harm justice very differently. And so do teams in different contexts, etc. Um, so when harm occurs, the restorative response understands that it's people who are hurt, it is relationships that are affected, and our goal is to restore well-being and relationships. Um, and we do that by applying these principles in our, in our work, which is synonymous with um, our everyday clinical work as health professionals. Um, and we operationalize these principles using practices that ask um, the following questions. So we, we look at um, what happened um, and why did it make sense at the time? So what is the reality? Who has been hurt and what are their needs? What is right? Who's responsible for meeting the needs of the people? Um, and what are their obligations? So what is compassionate? How can harms be repaired? Relations be relationships be made right again? So how do we restore that diminished um, tapu? Um, and then how do we prevent it from happening again? And when we think about that, we're not thinking about, you know, how do we put some things in place that will improve the system? We're thinking about what would it be like to be free of this harm uh, now and in the future? Um, and by that, we uncover people's needs. And what people's needs actually relate to um, the justice needs that are not synonymous with punishment, that's about a really holistic and caring approach that results in meaningful um, uh, restoration. Um, and we consider this within Indigenous health models, and there's quite a few that Swan Graham and I use, um, and they really express that connection between well-being and relationships and, and human well-being. Um, and also by using this approach, by listening before we act, um, we are um, we're, we're, um, able to adapt to emerging needs as we move through the harm. So we don't say, okay, this is what we need to know, this is what we need to understand, and we need to get to an end point. It's about that adaptive kind of relationship, and we learn, we learn through, through that relationship. So I think that's probably enough from me. Um, it's just a reminder of that beautiful beach where Graham lives. And I will stop at that point. And I guess um, I will open the floor to you guys to see what your questions might be um, or, or what you'd like to talk about with Graham and I for the last few moments we've had together. Robin. Hi, um, I'm wondering if you can give us an example, like can you tell a practical story about something that happened and how the restorative justice practice worked? 
Um, I, I can give you I can give you lots, but I've bored you all to death with my, my mesh inquiry. So I'm going to hand this one to Graham. Cheating. OK, can't buy it. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you a really simple example, uh, Robin. Uh, so we had um, uh, mum who came into our hospital and um, uh, they came in late, the uh, specialists and nurses and uh, midwives were all not at their best um, and um, the mother observed them having a, a conflict in front of her which she found really distressing, more importantly because she actually had some opinion <laughs> around what they were talking about, the birth of her child, which was ignored uh, because they're too busy basically having an argument with each other. So the actual birthing experience from the mother's perspective went fine and the child was well and all the rest. But she had felt that, you know, her birthing plan and her hopes for how her child would enter the world, she was Māori, which is in an enhanced state of tapu, uh, was diminished by the conflict that was happening around her birthing experience. So anyway, her midwife uh, who'd been involved in this conflict reached out and said that, uh, made a complaint, but then talked about how they'd like to resolve that. And we went through a restorative process where we worked with our, um, the consultant and the head of midwifery and the midwife and the mother and uh, her support people. Um, and um, initially met, in two separate groups. So met with particularly the consultant who was Pākehā, so um, uh, um, uh, um, European New Zealander, um, who was had never been through a Māori restorative process. Um, so the mother and the midwife who were both Māori were very comfortable with what we were going to do that. The experience something similar was a little bit afraid. So we worked through that. I sat with him and, and his support people and talked through how it went. Agreed that we'd meet and really we put it in between the, there was the complaint and then the investigation of the complaint and it went in between that space. And they came together and the mother led it off. So she got to talk about how she'd felt diminished and felt her child had been diminished. Uh, and that wasn't the start they wanted for that life because of the conflict. Um, and then the consultant was given the opportunity to talk about, you know, the long shift that it had, the conflicts and, diff, you know, challenges that had. Everyone gets a chance to talk, basically. Uh, and that kind of went around and around for a little bit until everyone felt talked out. And then we got people to articulate whether they were actually able to articulate other people's positions, which they were. Uh, and as you can imagine, in this you know, um, relatively simple incident, the immediate response was one of wanting to restore that relationship, to apologise, to to do what was necessary. But actually, that that uh, consultant's in our little video that we did, little movie, was actually quite impacting for him because getting in front of patients and parents in front of their families was really intimidating. So his, experience, his thought was that would be diminishing to him but to actually get there and see that they were just as protective of his well-being, his tapu, as he wanted to be of theirs was, you know, was incredibly powerful. So that's a really simple one, but one that I particularly like. That's awesome. Thank you. I, I can imagine that everyone would benefit from that type of process, not just Indigenous people. I, is, it, is, it, is it being applied? Is it starting to be applied everywhere? Or Yeah, yeah, that sounds awesome. Thank you. We, we use it, um, Robin, so if I just, a little, another example, um, just thinking about sort of how you can apply it beyond practice in a more sort of system kind of perspective as well. So the work we do with the National Collaborative, um, it um, has a whole bunch of stakeholders from across the system, from our regulator, um, our, our partners, the Health Quality Safety Commission and the SMAHI, um, consumers, um, leaders, co us that's Indigenous leaders um, and clinicians coming together to look at sort of the impact. So we use that restorative framework to shape kind of the change. So we've looked at what are the impacts of current responses to harm on all of the people who are affected by them. 
And then um, our, our next piece is, okay, so knowing that, what do we need to do? What are the foundations of a restorative system? And then who is responsible for that and what are their obligations? So using that restorative kind of thinking, you can apply it at all kinds of different levels. And, and certainly when we did the restorative inquiry, that was really complicated, complex in that I had all these different moving parts and people and relationships involved in it. Um, but keeping it within that framework was, was really helpful. But what we don't want to sell is that you just pick that framework up or the checklists and then you go out like you do with other things and say, right, I'm gonna go and have a restorative meeting today. Mm -hmm. Should probably hand back to you, Carl. We must have come so taking us to the end of our time. Well, um, yeah, and I guess it's just um, I'd love to thank you, Van, for the for listening into this. We, we've we sort of feel that like it's a really interesting space to explore, and we feel highly privileged in in our New Zealand to be working on this stuff together. And I think that um, it's hard to describe what we're we're up to, but it's um, we're really coming together to try and understand how we bring some of these ideas together. And I think we see this; they're not the same, but they have some some crossover, some some strengthening of each other, and 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 I think um, it's in stark contrast to some of the industrial models or, or sort of very conflict um, judicial models of resolving harm, those sort of things that we often see, or very bureaucratic approaches to both safety and and harm. So we hope it's been interesting. We hope um, we're interested to hear how that looks in other people's contexts. Um, but thank you very much indeed. I'll hand back to Mary for a final word in the middle of the night. <laughs> So um, I just, I would really like to thank um, Steph and Graham and Joe and Carl for uh, being willing to uh, share uh, both the background and sort of the rationale and, and the history and, and how you reached uh, the point where you are. And, and certainly um, I know probably many of us still have lots of questions. Um, we may reach out and um, there is a, a um, a note in the chat about sharing references and I am happy to distribute those uh, if you send them to me as well. I did record this presentation. Um, and so with everybody's permission, I will um, ask if we can post that link on, on the uh, RHC website as well and share it obviously with uh, you uh, so that you can share it with your colleagues um, as well. So um, again, thank you everybody in, in all your various time zones. And I, I think um, it was mentioned, we, we all hope that we can be together uh, because these, these kinds of conversations and discussions are just so valuable. And um, I know we wish we could continue them. Um, and, I, and I hope we will uh, later this summer. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank awesome. you very much. Thank you. Yes. I'll see you soon, hopefully. Yes. Thanks, Steph and Joe. Yeah.